A. A. Allen, you may not know of him, he was used mightily by God. He was also slandered. Uh, they falsely accused him of being an alcoholic and dying of alcoholism at the end of his life. That's not true. He was a godly man to the end of his life. He was murdered and framed by jealous Christians. A. A. Allen was coming down the tent line one night. And there was a demon-possessed woman. The aisle was like that. Demon-possessed woman sitting on the side of the seat. Nobody could get her to calm down. Nobody knew what to do. Brother Allen leaned over, whispered in her ear. She sat straight up and never moved again. He got up on stage, finished the service. They asked him, said, what did you tell her? He said, I told her A.A. A. Allen's here. How many of you have heard about the A.A. A. Allen Miracle Valley, the Miracle Revivals? His son, Paul Allen, who's still alive, has actually... Uh, been taking the chairs, they, they, they received a prophecy from the Lord that there is an angel with every one of the chairs that used to sit in the old tent. And so they have been, they have been basically giving these to people for donations. It's several hundred dollars for one of the chairs. A. A. Allen died in the hotel, in a hotel in San Francisco as an alcoholic. He was murdered and framed by jealous Christians. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Long for Truth. My name is Daniel Long. Sitting next to me is my lovely wife, Robin. Hi, everyone. Nice to be here. Nice to have Robin back, finally. I uh, really hate doing the videos by myself, so I'm always excited when she comes back on the program with me. All right. So today we are going to be talking about Asa Alonzo Allen, better known as A.A. A. Allen. Now, there are tons of people who think that A.A. A. Allen was one of God's generals, and that's because he's promoted that way by Robert Sleard in, in his book, God's Generals, and A.A. A. Allen was nothing of the sort. As a matter of fact, in this video, we're going to show who A.A. A. Allen actually was. Right, so he was a healing evangelist, you know, probably through the 50s and 60s into 1970, and most people know him as God's man of faith and power. So we're going to talk a little bit about him, just starting with his birth. He was born in 1911 in Arkansas mm -hmm. to a mixed race family, um, white and Native American, Native American, which reminds me of Oral Roberts. Yes. Also. And A.A. Uh, a. A. Allen's father was an alcoholic and he struggled with alcohol. Now, one of the things, if you watch Roberts Learden's video, on A.A. A. Allen. Yes. He says that by the time A.A. A. Allen was six years old, now think about this, six years old, that uh, he could handle his liquor just like any other grown man, and he smoked a pack of cigarettes today. Smoked a pack of cigarettes. Six years old. And I think Robert Little embellished. says that um, they put alcohol in his bottle when he was a baby. So When he was a little boy, they'd put uh, alcohol in his bottle, make him go to sleep. And by the age of six, he'd smoke two packs a day and could drink his liquor with everybody else of probably twice his age. He was just raised on alcohol. Yeah. Um, before we delve into a little bit more about A.A. A. Allen, let's give you a look at what kind of healing ministry he had. I want everybody here to do what I tell you and do it in the next 30 seconds. I want everybody under this tent tonight that are sick, diseased with cancer. Whether you know it or whether you just have a feeling or reason to believe or suspicion, you have cancer. And if every one of you that are afflicted with cancer will come running down these aisles and stand right here in front of me, I believe in God to heal every one of you right now. But you better hurry. Everybody that's sick with cancer, you have reason to believe you have incurable cancer, don't stand there. Come down here and stand in front of me. Gene, get ready to sing. You in front of me. I'm not going to pray. We're going to play. I said we're not going to pray. We're going to play. And while we sing and while we play, that foul devil of cancer, because I believe it's a spirit of infirmity, is going to leave you. Right? Do you believe it? Get ready to sing, Gene. My Lord. Listen, if you're sick and diseased and afflicted, write for my great book. God will heal you. Read it in your home. Thousands have been healed as they read it. 
And uh, all you have to do is just address a letter to A.A. A. Allen Revivals Incorporated and Miracles Today, the Allen Revival telecast, and address it to Miracle Valley, Arizona. I feel I'm gonna do something else. You that are in front of me, march over this ramp while we sing. And as you come, this music, I'm going to put a little prayer with it and lay my hands on you. And I'm believing every cancer to die as you march over this ramp tonight. <laughs> So at the end, that looked like a fast food healing line just to quickly go through if you have a busy day so that he is the McDonald's of healing evangelists. Yeah, that's that's a that's a good one. Um, and one of the things that um, we, we know that the devil, the Bible take make talks about the devil causing sickness. We know that in Luke 13, 11, it says, and behold, there was a woman who had a disabling spirit for 18 years, right? And uh, so I think uh, the King James says... It says the spirit of infirmity. Spirit of infirmity. Right. So we also look at Job and we see that in the book of Job that the devil does do that. But you can't take one isolated passage in the New Testament and make a whole doctrine of it, which is what a lot of people like to do. They like to say, well, because this woman had a spirit of infirmity or disabling spirit, that every sickness and disease is a demon. And that is right. just not biblical. And it was Satan that caused uh, Job's uh, boils mm -hmm. and other things. However, it was God's hand behind it. God is the one who allowed Satan to do it. You can look at that in Job. So Satan wasn't ultimately in control even of that situation. Right. Um, so we're going to see more of his healing techniques. Um, so in 1934, he was driving past a Methodist church that was having a meeting, and he went in, and a female preacher was there, and he got saved. Mm -hmm. So he would have been about 23 years old. A couple of years later, <clears throat> he went to a home meeting where he was introduced to Pentecostalism, and he said he received the uh, baptism of the Holy Spirit at that point and spoke in tongues. And this is when he decided at that point that this is what he wanted to do. He wanted to be an evangelist and a healer. Yeah, yeah. And so he became a pastor under the Assemblies of God in uh, Holly, Colorado, I believe is where it was, before he took his church in, um, what was Texas? Um, later on. Yeah, yeah, later on. Um, and so that's where he uh, started pastoring. So while A.A. A. Allen was pastoring the church in Holly, Colorado, he had a major spiritual event occur. He used to go into the prayer closet, tell his wife to lock him in, Again, like Oral Roberts mm. has a story like that. Um, but anyway, he, he would tell his wife to lock him in and she would unlock the door so that he could eat or whatever. She wouldn't lock him in. But this one time he was just bound and determined he needed to hear the voice of God to understand that he could move forward and serve God. So he said, lock me in here. Uh, he smelled the delicious dinner she was making and he wanted to get out, so he said he took one bite of dinner and was so convicted, he went back in the prayer closet, and he saw a light, finally. And he thought his wife opened the door, but no, it was the presence of God that came upon him in that prayer closet, Danny. And he claims that God told him 13 specific things that he needed to do in order to be kind of like a chosen vessel of God, to be used by God, especially in healing. And so he wrote a book about this, um, and we'll go through that a little bit. But some of the things that he says in that list of 13 items, now he never shares the last two items. He says they were very personal, but he does share the 11, the top 11 things are like, number one, the disciple is not above his master. So you can follow Jesus. You'll never do greater things than Jesus will do. But many of those 11 things, Danny, were very much about self-denial, 
uh, works, watching your tongue, watching what you do. Be perfect because your father is perfect. He must increase. Pick up your cross. Like it just keeps going on and on. And it seems to be the same theme with those 11 items. So he didn't have to read his Bible. He just had God come into the room and tell him all of these things rather than him just picking up his Bible and reading it. Because everything that Robin just mentioned there in those 13 things are in Scripture. Now, one of the things that I want to highlight really quickly before we move on about these 13 things. It seems to me like there's a lot of similarities, first of all, between these, uh, you know, post-World War faith healers. Like, for example, uh, the prayer closet and God coming to him in the prayer closet like Oral Roberts. Um, And, you know, one of the things that uh, it also seems very interesting is that many of these um, faith healers their conversion experience, or their they they have to have some kind of phenomenal conversion mm-hmm. experience, or some kind of phenomenal meeting with God before they go into ministry to kind of boost themselves up to their audience and tell you know show their audience, hey, look, I am a man of God. God came to me, and this is you know I, almost, I'm like Moses, almost like a burning bush experience. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it seems yeah. it seems very very common. Rather than just, you know, um, like most pastors are called into the ministry um, without any great experience, like uh, God coming to them and speaking to them, or a light shining in the room, or Jesus appearing to them, you know, in their bedroom and commissioning with, with them. With a plate of cookies. Yes, a plate of cookies. Or uh, commissioning them to write a uh, new translation of the Bible. Oh so anyway... So the final, well, number 11 on his list of 13 was being a partaker of his divine nature. Um, And I wanted to read uh, just a little quote of what um, A.A. Allen writes about that. Then when you are a partaker of his divine nature, there will be knowledge which comes to your mind out of the knowledge stored in the mind of God. Things which you need to know, but have no other way of knowing. God himself can and will reveal them to you. There will be power, for God is power. Miracle and signs will follow. The sick will be healed. The lame will walk. Cancers will vanish at your command. The blind will see. The deaf hear. Secrets of people's hearts will, when necessary, be made manifest. Souls will be stirred from the sleep of spiritual death and brought as new creatures into the kingdom. Yea, even some whose physical lives are gone may be brought again from the dead in the will of God. Let me ask you a question. Is this supposed to be God speaking directly to A.A. Allen from the 13 um, things that uh you know, he supposedly had heard from God. This uh, this was one of the things God said to God, and and God said to Alan. God said to Alan, and I think Alan is explaining it here what the partaker in his divine nature actually means. Ah, uh, okay, gotcha. Yeah, gotcha. So cancers will vanish at your command. The blind will see. The deaf will hear. Secrets of people's hearts and, will be will will when necessary, be made manifest. And you can raise the dead. And you can raise the dead. And there yep. was a, a story in Rand, James Randi's book, Faith Healers, which we're going to be, uh, there's going to be a couple of quotes from that book. It's a very good book, although Randi was not a Christian at all. Um, there's a good story about um, uh, this, this this whole idea of raising the dead. Randi says that A.A. A. Allen at one time, and I can't, I, I should have, had the quote with me, but A. A. Allen at one time had said that he was going to raise the dead. He was going to do this great miracle and raise the dead, but uh, he had to stop it because he, they, they, I guess they were afraid that people were going to start bringing in dead bodies to Miracle Valley. So he kind of nipped that in the bud. But um, so, so like in this quote, it says, "If it's the will of God to raise the dead," so obviously it wasn't God's will for him to raise the dead at that time. Not at that time, I guess. Okay. Yeah. So we're moving towards 1947 now. He was pastoring that large church in mm-hmm. Corpus Christi, Danny, a large Assemblies of God church. Yep. And two years later, he went to an Oral Roberts tent revival. Now, a lot of people say at that point, he said, if Oral Roberts can do it, I can do it. And it kind of was a turning point in his life 
um, the next year he left his pastorate. Was it the it was the following year yeah. he left his pastorate because he wanted to start a radio program and kind of build his brand. And the elders in his church uh, nixed it. They said, no, we don't want you to do that. So he left the Assemblies of God, supposedly, during that time. One of the things that is very common with these faith healers, these early Pentecostal guys, you know, from from Dowie all the way through, uh, you know, is these men and women did not like authority. They did not want to be under authority. They didn't want to be under a group of elders. Um, they didn't want to be under church leaders. They wanted to do their own thing. They kind of wanted to be autonomous in their ministry. And, you know, they wanted the, the full, they wanted to, you know, have the full say so. And so when they couldn't get their way, they would leave, but then they would start an invitation. Right. I think of Amy Semple McPherson, who um, left and started the Foursquare. Mm -hmm. And even if they didn't start their own denomination, they just wanted to be independent. So they didn't have that body of elders kind of trying to help them through whatever process they were going. Yeah, that's the purpose of having um, the elders in your church, the elders and deacons, to hold the pastor accountable so he is not the one that is making all the decisions, because that's a recipe for disaster right there in that's a church true. like that. Very true. So in 1950, he also published his first article with the Voice of Healing magazine, and I was hoping you could talk a little bit about his relationship with the Voice of Healing so the Voice of Healing magazine uh, really started because of William Branham and the Branham Healing Campaigns. And it was uh, created to kind of um, you know, popularize Branham. Lindsay ended up becoming the, um, the, 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 the main guy of the Voice of Healing revivals and the Voice of Healing magazine. But he did um, have a lot of different evangelists and popular evangelists under the umbrella of the Voice of Healing uh, campaigns, Or Roberts, A.A. A. Allen, Jack Coe, T.L. Osborne, of course, William Branham. And there are just a number of different uh, ministers under the whole Voice of Healing revival campaigns and magazine. And interesting that Gordon Lindsay actually was born in Zion City. Yes. So Gordon Lindsay. Yeah. Okay. I mean, this like stuff, can, can we could talk just about this. It for just an hour. kind of works its way back. Okay. So let's go back. Zion City was a commune. Okay. But it was a humongous commune. As a matter of fact, it was a city. Dowie, John Alexander Dowie uh, in 19, I believe it was in 1901, uh, established Zion City, Illinois, and he forced many of his followers to move to Zion City. They had factories, they had houses, they had um, a bank. Um, Didn't you tell me that they had to sign like a 900-year lease or 900 something? 999-year lease on their homes. It, doesn't that remind you of like the Christian scientists who sign up for a billion years? It's it, it's just craziness. So anyway, this is how Dowie controlled his people. Yeah, Scientology. Yes. Yeah. This is how Dowie controlled his people. So Gordon Lindsay was born in Zion City. Now, um, he didn't grow up there. Because Dowie fell in 19, or was exposed, I should say. He, he, he was exposed as a fraud in 1906. And, and um, because of that, he was ousted from his position. So his parents, Lindsay's parents, Gordon Lindsay's parents moved away from Zion City, and they moved to what was called the Pigs, the, the Pigs, the Pisgah, the Pisgah. There we go. Whew, say that three times. The Pisgah community which was another commune. Well, it wasn't nearly as elaborate as Zion City. And I, and I not that Zion City was anything elaborate, but that was, you know, the Pisgah community wasn't that great. So they left and they moved to Oregon. Now, Lindsay con, uh, considers himself to have been converted under the teaching of Charles Fox Parham right. in John G. Lake's church. So John G. Lake, while he was in Oregon, had Parham come in and do evangelistic meetings. And in uh, Lake's church, where Parham was preaching, Lindsay says as a young man, he 
he got saved. Um, and so John G. Lake took a liking to Gordon Lindsay and ended up taking Gordon with him to some of his tent healing uh, revivals and ended up giving Gordon Lindsay a tent. And for a little while, Gordon Lindsay was an evangelist, but he wasn't a good faith healer. He yes. just wasn't a good faith healing evangelist. He was a better organizer. He was a he, he was, back of the house. Yeah, yeah. And so he's the one that established and, and really popularized guys like William Branham and um and, and T.L. Osborne and he a. was a. just such a key figure in the voice of yeah. healing. So now you can see when A. A. Allen joins the voice of healing, what kind of establishment it is, and he gets a really good start there. Yeah, th it's it's an amazing story, yeah. and it is so so deep, and there are a lot of things written about it. But uh, yeah, it is it is something that um, you know this could be it, this could be talked about in, in an in an entire episode. We could do an episode just on and maybe how we the, will. the connections of Zion City right. to the Voice of Healing. So yeah, right. So that was 1949, 1950. Now in 1951. He wanted his own tent, so he bought Jack Coe's old revival tent, which was the biggest tent in the world. It was like a foot bigger than Oral Roberts' tent. So A. A. Allen bought that, and he started doing his traveling revivals. Mm -hmm. um, we wanted to show you another clip right now of him healing a female doctor. Look at this precious little woman. She went to a fortune teller some time ago. She told me this afternoon I had a private interview with this woman. Oh. Oh, and since she visited that fortune teller, something went out with her. You better be careful when you go to these fortune tellers. And the woman says it's something mental. She believes that it's a demon. And I might warn every one of you, demons hang out at fortune telling joints. Oh, this thing's gonna leave you tonight, lady. Oh, yes. Don't you believe it? Oh, yes, I know. You've got to have help. Oh, yes. Oh, oh. Hmm? oh yes. I can't do this by myself. You're desperate. Oh. How does this thing affect your mind? Every word I say, it or she or he hears me. Oh, Every you. conversation I have, and I'm warned not to, or I'm... Sometimes my throat is so constricted. Oh, I can tell you in so many ways, sometimes I've already received the Holy Ghost, and that's something I can't understand, is how I can have two. No, no, I can't either. I can't, I don't understand. Well, we're going to pray right now. Oh. If you ever prayed, pray with this lady. Oh. She's a professional woman who's come to the end of the road, who must have help. Thou oppressing spirit, thou oppressing devil, in the name of Jesus, I bind you, Satan. I charge you in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Let the power of God come on this woman, Lord. Let the power of God come on her now. Let her free in Jesus' name. Go from her life. Go from her mind. Thou foul insane devil. Go in Jesus' name, I charge you. Peace. Peace. Okay. Well, that's. <laughs> <laughs> the, Do not tell me that was not a show. That was nothing overly dramatic about that no, healing. But it really do, does uh, go to show you that deliverance ministries are nothing new. I mean, they the even the older guys like A.A. A. Allen and these uh, other faith healers believed that Christians could be demon possessed. Um, you heard her say, I got the Holy Spirit. I don't understand how I can have two. You know, um, right. and he's like, well, I don't know either, but right. blah, blah, blah. So maybe uh, they didn't quite go as far as the deliverance ministers, but y you can see the thing there. See the beginnings of it. Right. So concerning that he mentions he had met her earlier in a private meeting. And of course, our first question was, 
why didn't you just heal her then? It's like you keep the demon for four more hours. Yes, and then show I'll up heal at the you. big meeting. We'll in do it in everybody. front of everyone because mm -hmm. it'll be a good show. Yeah. And also a little off that he spoke King James Version to the demon. That's probably because the demons only understood King James language back then. You know, there wasn't all these other translations out there. There's something off there. This whole thing was a show. And that's one of the things you and I talked about as we Intense. were watching mm -hmm. the videos. It's, it's all a show. It's all a show. So um, A.A. A. Allen in 1953 uh, had a radio program just like he wanted to. So in 1955, um, something concerning happened. He was pulled over in Tennessee for drunk driving. And there is a lot of uh, material on this particular episode on both sides of the coin. Was he or was he not drunk driving? Um, Alan said that an Alan's friend that was with him said we were driving to the tent meeting. We stopped at a diner and we had a glass of milk and a. a allen said something tastes funny but i guess he kept drinking the milk <laughs> he said then we got to the tent meeting and the police were waiting for us there and that is where they gave him a ticket for drunk driving so they didn't stop him evidently in the car for drunk driving and they just waited for him to get there number one and number two why do you keep drinking something if, if it doesn't taste right? This tastes really bad. Let me finish it. And number three, one of the things that you mentioned was if he had a drinking problem, right. he would have definitely known that there was alcohol in his milk. You, would he not? You know. Yeah, yeah, you absolutely know. So we want to go to this article, um, the Capital Journal. Salem, Oregon, written in 1956. Keep in mind, it was in 1955 that he was pulled over in Tennessee. Uh, church suspends minister, head of Oregon Corporation. And let me just say something before you read this. When I'm, as I'm showing the article on screen, there's a lot of little tiny holes in the in the the newspaper article probably it looks like somebody used it as a <laughs> to shoot bb's at but anyway that's not something we did that's just something that was there in the article okay reverend a.a a. allen head of an oregon corporation known as a.a a. allen revivals incorporated has run afoul of the law in tennessee because of alleged drunk driving and is now under suspicion as a minister of his church pending trial before the tennessee presbytery assemblies of god it became known here today. Headquarters of the corporation have now apparently been moved to Dallas, Texas. One of the functions of the corporation's corporation headed by Allen, according to the Articles of Incorporation filed in 1951 with the State Corporation Department, is teaching and practicing divine healing as taught in the Bible. The corporation papers list Allen as president and gives the address of all the incorporators as Bethel Park, headquarters of the Oregon Presbytery of the Assemblies of God at Brooks. Questioned about Allen's present standing, Reverend George Davis, assistant superintendent of the Oregon Presbytery, said the Allen's Corporation that it has no connection with us. And he said that Allen is under suspension as a minister pending trial before the Tennessee Presbytery. So far, he has failed to appear for trial. Records furnished the church officials show that Allen was arrested by the Tennessee Highway Patrol for drunk driving on complaint of other motorists. On October 25th, a preliminary hearing was held in Knox County, Tennessee, and a bond of $1,000 was posted for Allen's appearance for trial October 29. He didn't appear, and his attorney stated that he did not know Allen's whereabouts. His bond was declared forfeited. For some reason, the case was reopened in last January 7 in the court of Judge J. Fred Bibb in Knox County. Allen again failed to appear, and final forfeiture of the bond was declared. One of the things that I have found in my own research, especially among the early Pentecostal leaders, is that they were in the papers for disobeying the law a lot. And A. A. Allen is just one of them. Some, not all of them were, but Dowie, Parham, Lake, A. A. Allen, Branham, they were all in the papers for some reason or another for not abiding by, uh, you know, the, the law of the land. It seemed to be uh, double lives mm -hmm. they were leading. Yeah. 
So um, Alan had a number of huge supporters who just said this did not really happen. This was all a setup. It was a hoax. And they blamed organizations that did not want to see Alan succeed. They blamed what the Catholic the Catholics, the communists, they blamed the assemblies of God. Right. So we have another article, Catholic and Reds blamed. So in this article, Danny, from the Honolulu Advertiser in December of 1956, it states Catholics and Reds blamed one of A.A. A. Allen's lieutenants charged last night that the Assembly of God churches teamed up with the communists and the Roman Catholics and framed the minister on a drunk driving charge in Tennessee. The Reverend John Douglas made the charge at a revival meeting in Civic Auditorium. Referring to news stories yesterday about the drunk driving charge, Douglas shouted, Knoxville framed up on Brother Allen and run him in prison. The communists and Roman Catholics framed up on him and put him in jail, he said. What gets me is that the leaders of the Assemblies of God have joined up with the Catholics and Protestants to try to kill A.A. A. Allen. A communist newspaper and a Catholic press tried to persecute a Holy Ghost man, he said. Douglas punctuated his sermons with frequent, frequent rebel yells, during which he would jump up and down on the stage. He occasionally got part of his audience jumping as well. I don't fight anybody, he said. There are thousands of good Catholics. The Reverend Robert Schombach followed Brother Douglas and told his audience that the Constitution allowed Americans to worship as, as they pleased. Then he added, nobody is going to come out here and tell us how to praise God. Brother Schombach worked over the local press during his sermon, urging the crowd to give generous offerings. We want to make the devil mad again tonight. We made him mad last night and he splashed his work all over the front pages today, he said. So I don't know if R.W. Schombach was A.A. A. Allen's only right-hand man, but he was one of the high-ranking lieutenants in A.A. A. Allen's entourage, okay? So Schombach was the guy that would start things out, and uh, he would get things going, and then A.A. A. Allen would come out. Um, and Schombach also became a tele, uh, televangelist, Word of Faith guy, um, and talks about giving um, being a way to activate the miraculous. And he come out and he said, I believe God's going to do great things tonight. But he said, before I preach, I want you to give God an offering of faith. Because when you give, you precipitate an offering. I mean, you participate, precipitate a miracle that's coming your way, especially if you're obedient to God. And he says he got that from A.A. A. Allen. So. And Catherine Crick got it from him. Uh, I guess they all get it from each other. They're all I a bunch of scam Oh, yeah. my. So right around this time, 1956, A.A. Um, a. Allen resigned from the voice of healing. It really went totally independent, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Made his own magazine, Miracle Magazine, which by the end of 1956 had over 200,000 subscribers already. Uh, James Randi has a couple things to say about A.A. A. Allen. Now, yeah. James Randi, the author of... Faith Healers. Right. And um, James Randi was not a Christian. He is the one that uh, busted Peter Popoff. If you remember the whole Peter B the Popoff scan, yeah, where he had uh, an earpiece in and his wife was giving him information about people in the audience. Uh, so that's who James Randi is. But his book, Faith Healers, is worth the read. Right. So he states the following... When Allen discovered radio and television, he abandoned his tent and switched to, ele to the electronic media. By mail, he sold prosperity cloths, pieces of his old tent, for a hundred to a thousand dollar donations. The idea was that all those years of high powered preaching had impregnated the fabric and would bring a blessing to the owner by radiation alone. Now, Danny, how many people have we heard that have done this? I know Oral Roberts sent out the handkerchiefs yep. and things like that. And they've just done this for time in memoriam, right? Yeah. Yeah. And, and here's the thing that really bothers me. And I think um, you and I talked about this. What is the difference between doing what A.A. A. Allen did selling and, and, and some of these other faith dealers selling prayer cloths um, or even pieces of your old tent? How is that different from the Catholics and their relics back during the Reformation days. I mean, it, it's very, yeah. very similar. It's, it's you're right. crazy. Mm. 
Randy also states he crowed about 60-year-old Tom Jennings, a man in a wheelchair with a blanket over his legs, who Alan said had cancer that gave him only six weeks to live. Alan said Jennings had the cancer demon and promptly cast it out, then told Jennings to wheel him, Alan, down the aisle. The crowd cheered Jesus for yet another miracle, but Jennings had never been told that he had only six weeks to live, wrote reporters from the Look magazine in a 1969 article, and Alan himself had seated Jennings in that wheelchair and supplied the blanket. Jennings not only was able to walk, but had years ahead of him. So they do these kinds of scams. It's been going on. Faith healers are nothing but scam artists, and they know how to, you know, um, to, to, to win a crowd over. They know how to work up a crowd. They know how to make it look like they've performed miracles. Um, and so they're just scam artists. That's what they are. And that's what A.A. A. Allen was, selling pieces of his tent, selling prayer cloths, um, and then some of these other uh, clips that you're going to see, it's it's just a show. It looks like a gigantic circus. Very much so. Uh, by the end of the 1950s, he built a Bible school. Someone had donated 1,280 acres in Arizona mm -hmm. to his ministry, and he called that ministry Miracle Valley. Okay, so he made this huge thing, and I think we have a clip about Miracle Valley. We do. This is A.A. A. Allen uh, receiving a prophecy, um, a direct revelation from God about Miracle Valley. In 1959, through a supernatural gift of utterance, God said concerning this valley, and I quote, This is my valley. Here have I called my people. Yea, I have ordained it. In the beginning, in the early centuries, have I ordained this valley. When I did lay the foundations of the world, when I placed the heavens above, and when I lay the waters of the seas, at that time did I make this valley. Yea, I did walk in it from mountain to mountain, Yea, in this valley have I called my people, and from this valley they shall go forth, and I, the Lord thy God, shall go with them. And I have looked upon my harvest, and I have said, Where are my labors? There are so few. The fields are white, and the sheaves are falling. There are many that I have called, and I have chosen. I have said in my heart, I will set my valley aside. I shall call my people, those that will hearken unto my voice, and I will speak unto my people, and I will endue them with power through the Holy Ghost. Yea, I, the Lord, have spoken unto my people, and I will walk among them, and I will speak through them. They shall come from the east, they shall come from the west, from the north and from the south into this place to prepare here to go under my whitened harvest fields. I will open the windows of heaven, and I will pour out of my power, and I will bless thee, and I will give thee that which thou hast desired." Unquote. And in 1958, it was a desire of my heart to have a huge piece of property or a piece of land whereby we could build a great Bible training centers and house a. a. Allen Revivals Incorporated. This is Miracle Valley. So Miracle Valley held a Bible school. He built a church that could hold 4,000 people on it. He had all of his um, printing presses there for his magazine. And he had a community. There was a neighborhood like you could live in Miracle Valley, large warehouse building, huge administrative, administrative building. So there was just a lot going on at Miracle Valley, Danny. So what do you think of? When you hear A.A. A. Allen talk about this prophecy that uh, 
he, he gave. You think of Abraham, right? Right. Walking through the land, God telling Abraham to walk up and down through the land. And uh, so what Miracle Valley is, is like Israel. I mean, that's, mm. these men make huge claims, don't they? Right. America's holy land. I know I heard a couple of things, Danny, about Miracle Valley that they didn't, think they would be able to find water. And there was a prophecy about how far they'd have to drill down to find water. And then when people came to visit Miracle Valley, uh, some of them just drank out of the water fountains and were healed by the healing powers of the water there. Well, I'm surprised they didn't find the fountain of youth there either, you know. But anyway, Um, so (laughs) I mean, all of these uh, grandiose claims of healing and stuff. And you'll see as we move forward how bad some of the stuff actually is. Yes. Speaking of grandiose claims, Mm -hmm. we have um, A.A. Allen healing with his shadow. But a shadow of Peter healed all that were vexed by unclean spirits. This lady has a slip disc since 1962. She's had one operation, but she cannot stoop nor bend the work. Bring me the last one. The last shall be first, and the first shall be last. Stand her right there. Right there. I decree that when my shadow, according to the word of God and according to the prophet, that word, that the moment my shadow overcast this little woman, way over in Nevada, that God is going to put in a new disc and let her do what she has been unable to do since 1962. Because she cannot bend, she can't stoop, and can do no work. How many believe God tonight? Amen. Do you believe it? Amen. Do you believe it? Yes, I do. Tonight. I believe him tonight. God's going to give you a new disc. Tonight. A new spine. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Step up a little closer. Right thank there. You. Thank you. Ladies, stand right there. When I step in front of her, I want every one of you to shout, Jesus. Because when I step in front of her, my shadow is going to overcast her. And she's going to stoop and bend, and God's going to give her a new spine and a new backbone. Say yes. yes. Lady, are you ready? I'm ready. I'm Is ready. God going to do it? He's going to do it tonight. Say friends. Friends. When this shadow. When this shadow. Overshadows me. Overshadows me. God's going to give me. God's going to give me. A new backbone. A new backbone. I'm going to bend. Well, I mean again. And I'm going to stoop over. And I'm going to stoop over. Get ready. Hallelujah. Are you ready to stop me? Three steps. One for the father. One for the Son, and one for the Holy Ghost. That was a big wow. Do you think Peter said when his shadow fell on these people that needed to be healed? I'm going to take one one step for the Father, one for the Son, and one for the Holy Ghost. Yeah. That it, was a show. Yeah. And it's one event in, in um in the New Testament, in the book of Acts, in in it's in a descriptive text. It's not a prescriptive text saying that this is what we can now do. Our shadow can heal. Same thing with Paul and the handkerchiefs. It's one uh, descriptive text of what actually happened. It's not prescribing how Christians are to, you know, are to act. We're not to do this. We're not taught to do this in Scripture. Well, the modern, very popular healers tend to cling to these things. Is it Hubert Angel or Shepard Bushiri who walked in front of a group of people who were in wheelchairs and made sure a shadow fell on them all and they were all healed. Yeah. Yeah. This is it's just yeah, it's bad stuff. It's it's all a show. It is. Um let's go ahead and look at another clip where A. A. Allen asked that God save everyone. We are a believer. 
We believe God's word from Genesis to Revelation, and the Bible said these signs shall follow them that believe. How many of you believe that I believe? Amen. Do you believe that I believe everything in this old book? Yeah. And hear me, uh, however, we don't claim to heal the sick. We merely lay our hands on the sick, the suffering, the dying. It is Christ who heals them. Yeah. You notice this verse said uh, that uh, they should go forth and these signs should follow them to believe. The next verse in your Bible said, and they went everywhere. Preaching the word, the Lord working with them. Doing what? Confirming his word with signs following. And the same Lord that worked with these in the 16th chapter of Mark is working with us today. This is why we see the sick healed. This is why unclean spirits come out. This is why multitudes are healed of every sickness, disease, and infirmity. Not because I'm a healer, but because I'm a believer. And these signs today still follow the believer. You say, but I'm not a believer. All right, bow your head. I'm going to ask God to make a believer out of every one of you. If you bow your heads, if you right there in your home, get on your knees and say, my God, I want to be a believer because unless I'm a believer, I can't even make heaven my home. I'm going to ask God to save every unbeliever. Under this tension in your home, I'm going to ask God to do it now. My Lord, in Jesus' name, save every sinner, save every unbeliever. But watch this telecast in Jesus' name. Name, save them now for the glory of God. And let these signs follow their life until Jesus comes. And all the people said, Amen. God bless you. So I don't understand, Danny. It seems like he had the most opportune time to share a gospel presentation if he asked the crowd if they were all believers and Many of them were not. One of the things that we have not seen a lot with A.A. A. Allen is a clear biblical gospel presentation. Um, I don't even know if the man knew the biblical gospel. Now, I don't claim to have watched every A.A. A. Allen video, mm -hmm. but I have watched a lot, and I have not heard a clear gospel presentation from A.A. A. Allen at all. Um, so that's one thing. They also use the uh, long ending of Mark there, saying, These signs shall follow those who believe. Mark 16, starting in verse 15. And he said to them, Go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will accompany those who believe. In my name they will cast out demons, they will speak in new tongues, they will pick up serpents with their hands, and if they drink any deadly poison, it will not hurt them. They will lay their hands on the sick, and they will recover. So then the Lord Jesus, after he had spoken to them, was taken up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God. And they went out and preached everywhere, while the Lord worked with them and confirmed the message by accompanying signs. So despite that this text, the long ending of Mark, is a disputed text, if you have your Bibles, um, and you open them up to your, and I'm, I've got a physical Bible here in front of me, and it has a little footnote here right after verse 8. And it says, the earliest manuscripts and some other ancient witnesses do not have Mark 16, 9 through 20. So the earliest Greek manuscripts um, didn't have it. So this is a disputed text. Now, this isn't a video about the long ending of Mark. Google it. There's or Google it and look on YouTube. James White has done a great uh, a great presentation on the long ending of Mark. Um, there are other videos out there about the long ending of Mark um, and whether it should be included uh, here at the end of uh, Mark's gospel. But even if it is, even if it is, um, you cannot take something that. Um, uh, that, that, that describes everything here. So they're going to pick up snakes. They're going to drink deadly poison. Oh, and they're going to drive out demons and they're going to lay hands on the sick. So you have to admit what? Handling snakes and drinking poison. The only consistent 
Pentecostal believers are those who believe the entire passage. And that would be uh, the, the snake handling churches and right. those who actually do drink poison right. in order to show that they actually believe this text. Um, so, I mean, it's just, again, even if this is... Um, even if this is in the law, the long ending of Mark is is supposed to be there. Mm -hmm. Valid. They're not doing everything that this passage says believers will do, at least right. not the mainline Pentecostal believers. Right. And do you want to build a doctrine, such a huge doctrine mm -hmm. in your um, church based on that particular passage? No. Right. And how do you reconcile what Paul makes extremely clear when he talks about the gifts? Not all are going to have, you know, are going to have healing gifts, just like not all are going to speak in tongues. Right. So A. A. Allen firmly believed that we all should be able to heal people mm -hmm. as long as we're following whatever God tells us we have to do, like he got his 13, 13 points. Yeah. Um, we're going to watch another A. A. Allen clip where he talks about us speaking the oracles of God. Then the time Jesus spoke the word, a mountain moved. Yeah, yeah. But do you mean to tell me that we can't speak words? Here is what the Lord said, and listen. You said you believe you're God? Well, the Bible said, if any man, that means you, I'm referring to me, if any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. Oh, yeah. oh go on and praise the Lord. Amen. I'm going to speak and your mountain is going to move. Your cancer is going to drop off. Your arthritis, your rheumatism, your high blood pressure is going to leave. Your sugar is going to go. Listen, say, can men do that? In the 17th chapter of 1 Kings, verse 16, the barrel of meal wasted not, neither did the cruise of oil fail. I'm quoting scripture. According to the word of the Lord, which he, which God, spake by Elijah. A widow woman, starving to death, heard the voice of a man. But that was God speaking through a man. In 2 Kings 4, when Elisha found the widow woman destitute, bankrupt, preparing to sell her own son to the slave market to pay the bills of a deceased husband, he spoke. But when he spoke, it was not a man speaking, but it was a man filled and anointed with God, speaking as the oracles of God, and it was God speaking to a man. All right, so this entire sermon, Robin, was a Word of Faith sermon. It's about 30 minutes long. You can watch it on YouTube. Um, and. It is all about you having the power to speak and your words being powerful enough to make things happen. Mm -hmm. his, his main text was Mark 11 and the cursing of the fig tree. And basically he was saying in this sermon that because Jesus spoke and the fig tree withered, we have the same exact power to do that. We can, with our own words, we can cause cancers to fall off people. We can right. cause the dead to be raised. We can cause sickness to flee. So all of that is what the context is in that clip. So basically, Robin, he is saying when he talks about speaking the oracles of God, that comes from 1 Peter chapter 4. Mm -hmm. And that is Peter talking about being good stewards of God's gifts that he gives you. Um, this is not meaning that we have power to be able to speak whatever we would desire into existence. And this is the problem with A. A. Allen. His doctrine was basically word of faith right. doctrine. Right. Um, in this next clip, he's going to talk about speaking to your mountain. Oh, good. Here we go. God, hear me. Many of you people in this camp meeting left a mountain at home. When you get back from this camp meeting, get back to Philadelphia, New York, Chicago, Los Angeles, Seattle, and Florida, you're saying, oh, God, when I get back home, I don't want to have to face the conditions and the situation that I left when I came here to this camp meeting. Amen. 
And many of you have a mountain at home, but many of you brought some mountain with you. Nearly everyone here have come for many miles, some of you thousands of miles, to be loose and liberated from wheelchairs, hearing aids, crutches, canes, and trusses. Those things become mountains. Jesus did not want a mountain to stand between us and heaven, or our blessing, our prosperity, or our health, or our well-being. Amen? So there you have uh, prosperity gospel light there. Um, they didn't all at this time talk a lot about, you know, speaking your your to your wallet like Marilyn Hickey did and creating money. But the prosperity gospel was still in their uh, messages. Absolutely. He wrote a booklet that God wants you to have wealth. So he's right in that vein. Yep. Yep. And now A.A. A. Allen is going to heal a man with arthritis. Get ready. Do you believe you'll walk again? Yes. When? Uh, right now. Right now? Amen. I'm going to speak the word. For him, I'm going to speak the word for you here. And I'm going to speak the word for you in your home and you in your home. You there in your home, you in your home. My God is going to move the mountain. Brother, you've got a mountain. Yes? Yes. I have a mountain. Do you want to walk again? Yes. You believe you will tonight? Yes, I believe. But you know you can't unless God heals you. That's right. Get ready. This is a mountain. Stand with me, brethren. Pray with me. Get ready. I'm going to call this a mountain of arthritis. Will he walk? Will you walk? Will your cancer drop off? Will God set you free? Get ready. What God will do for one, he'll do for everyone. And if God will not do it for everyone, he'll not do it for anyone. Oh, you foul devil. Oh, it's a mountain. I'm so used to calling things devils, but this is a demon. But I'm calling it a mountain. Now, Jesus, don't you feel me? God, there's too many people watching tonight. You can't feel me. Thou mountain of helplessness, thou mountain of destruction, thou mountain of arthritis, thou mountain of demoniac power that binds these limbs. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, you devil, I charge you. Hallelujah. I command this mountain go. Be thou plucked up, removed, and placed into the sea. Oh, you mountain of crippling arthritis. Go! Come on! Come on! Come on! Come on! Come on! Talk about a show. Believable? <laughs> I mean, it reminds me of Ernest Angeli. You remember the Ernest Angeli? You old devil! You know, it, that's what it reminds me. I it bet that's where Ernest Angeli got. It reminded me of a game show. Will he walk? Yeah. Will he walk? Like um, it was like Wheel of Fortune or so let's can make you, a deal. So can you imagine Peter, James, and John, you know, or Peter, you know, is there is there going to the, the with temple? The crowds. Yeah, mm -hmm. with the crowds and them healing the man there at the temple that had been lame from birth. Folks, is he gonna walk? Will he do it? It listen, folks, this was a show. Yeah, and what was up with Jesus? Don't fail me. Well, he didn't want to. He didn't want. Well, it, again, it's it's all part of the act. Choice of, of words. Act, but yeah, he's basically 
saying, oh, I, I, you got you to gotta do this, Lord, because if you don't do this, then it's going to look like you're not real. So make yourself real and do this. That's basically what he's saying by Jesus, don't fail me. A little bit of bending and pounding on the legs and yeah. rubbing the head. And yeah, you we're know, we're going to get a miracle here. Yeah, exactly. Mm. Okay. So in 1967, A.A. A. Allen and his wife, Lexi, divorced. They had four children. Um, at the end of his life, he had a prophecy, another prophecy about Miracle Valley, in which he said, it will go destitute. And then in the end times, God will use Miracle Valley as the beginning of the place of revival. So that is what we are to be looking for now. Um, in 1970, on, yeah. I thought I was going to be can in the whole Kansas City area. Oh, that's right. So there are different prophecies by different prophets. Mm. Somebody's going to be wrong. Somebody's going to be wrong on this one. So. Unless they both, I guess, pop up at the same time and are used. On June 11th, 1970, at the age of 59, A.A. A. Allen died in his hotel room at the Jack, Har Jack Tar Hotel in San Francisco, California. He was found by his um, right-hand man at that time, Don Stewart, and he supposedly, Danny, was surrounded by alcohol bottles and prescription drug bottles, and Don Stewart was actually trying to clean up the scene before he called the police. Yeah, and uh, Robert Slearden mentions that A.A. A. Allen had some serious health issues, and he was in a lot of pain. Yes. Uh, so I think it was his knees. Um, it might have been the arthritis, but that he had those health issues and that he was drinking for medicinal reasons. Now, here's the thing that is so um, that, that should pop the question that should pop up into everyone's mind. Alan was a faith healer. He healed everybody. Why didn't he heal himself? You know, people say never believe a faith healer that wears glasses. Um, which is true, but also never believe a faith healer that has a sickness and they can't heal themselves. Right. So, you know. Yeah. And it was one of the reasons Alan, that Don Stewart said Alan was hesitant about going to the doctors, which was why he was in San Francisco. He was going to go to the doctor about his serious arthritis, his bad knee. But he said he didn't like to go to a lot of doctors because he knew he was a faith healer and it would look bad. So there, there you, you go. go. So, um, we have an article from the Aniston Star, um, Aniston, Alabama. Evangelist Allen died of alcoholism. An autopsy shows acute alcoholism caused the death of Asa A. Allen, an evangelist and faith healer who was found dead in his hotel room here June 11, reports coroner Dr. Henry Turkle. Initially blamed on a possible heart attack, Allen's death came as the result of acute alcoholism and fatty infiltration of the liver, Turkle reported Wednesday after pathological tests. The 59-year-old evangelist blood alcohol content was 0.36%, enough to ensure a deep coma, Turkle said. Allen was buried June 15th at his 2,400-acre headquarters in Miracle Valley, Arizona, where he planned many of his television and radio shows and directed his $2 million a year Miracle Revival Fellowship. Something that's very strange, too, about all of this is that before Allen died, um, very shortly, um, like I believe days before he died, he made a recording of himself saying that he was not dead. And so the recording went out. He sent it to friends. Yes, yes. And the recording went out. And um, so the, so at first there was the, the report that he had died. And then this recording surfaces and saying, Alan saying, I'm not dead. I'm very much alive. And we're going to continue the meeting. Yeah. And so um, and then. Uh, it, it fi they find out he, find out he actually days. did die. Yes. Dead. So, yeah, there were some very strange, strange things going on there. Yeah. Um, now, Alan's family 
and friends denied any kind of drinking problem, mm-hmm. any kind of moral failure whatsoever. And we have his grandchildren talking about that now. Okay, let me just tell you a story Bobby Connor told me. Uh, I met him up at Reading and he was telling me about my grandfather. He said, I read all the stories. I didn't know him personally, but I read stories about him. And so I repeated stories. I read out of some very popular books. Uh-huh. And they said that my grandfather failed morally as far as drinking and became an alcoholic. And many people actually believe that story. Right, right. It's not true at all. And my father, from my, the youngest years, would say, Cheryl, honey, whatever you do, never believe the lies. Those right. are not true. He did right. not drink. I knew him well. So Bobby Connor is telling me, and he says, I told everybody, you know, just follow God and be careful and do what's right. And he said, I got home to the room that night, to my hotel room, and the Holy Spirit rebuked me soundly, more soundly than I've ever been rebuked before. And he said, my servant A.A. Allen stands before me righteous and you a liar. And he said, I said, what did I do? And he said, you quoted stories that you heard from other people. Wow. And you believe them and you pass them on to hundreds of people and so Bobby went back and told the whole group the next day not true he's righteous he didn't fall David you have something well, just don't cheap shot uh, yeah. God's generals and those that have given their life for the kingdom they talked about Bobby Connor Bobby Connor you know or being you know talking about A.A. A. Allen and giving stories about him and talking about his alcoholism and all this other stuff and then he goes back to his hotel room and he prays or, or the Holy Spirit speaks to them as he's praying speaks to him as he's praying and says you're in big trouble because you are slandering my righteous servant A.A. A. Allen. I preached Robert Slareton's book The Generals Lord visited with me and said, you lied to, you lied to the people about my servant, A.A. A. Allen. I said, no, I didn't lie. He said, I preached exactly what Robert Slareton had written. And the Lord said, oh, that's a lie. When you die and stand before me, you're going to find out that A.A. A. Allen died righteous, murdered by the Christian mafia, I might add. And, you know, so we're supposed to just take their word for it that it didn't happen. Right. Why should we do that? So, of course, you ask, well, what about those blood tests? He had that mm-hmm. blood alcohol content of 0.36. They state that the um, coroner was paid off of to course. change his results because his initial finding was just, oh, yeah, it was a heart attack. And then yeah. he comes back and says, well, the blood alcohol content was this. And they state that the people who did not want A.A. A. Allen to be at the top of his ministry uh, paid the corner to make it look bad to Sully Allen's name. Um, we do have an a page from an FBI report that goes back to, we're just going to start from 1946. He was pulled over for drunken driving, drunken driving and fined $40, paid and released. And that was in Las Vegas. Uh, The next one in Laguna Beach, California, 1956, drunk, $25, bond forfeited. Um, Again in Los Angeles in 1959, um, he was fined with being drunk, San Diego, California, in 1960, again. So you see that this seems to be an ongoing problem with all law enforcement. And are we to believe that law enforcement across America was in cahoots with the Roman Catholic Church and the and, communists. Yeah. So it's all a ginormous, gets bigger and bigger and bigger, this conspiracy theory against um, A.A. A. Allen. And of course, the final one, Jacksonville, Florida in 1964, driving while intoxicated. This does not even include the Tennessee um, charge. Mm-hmm. That was 1955. 1955. So there were three drunk driving charges and then a number of just drunkenness charges against a a allen folks a a allen was not a man of god a a allen was a scam artist he was a shyster he was also a man that struggled with alcohol now let me just say this robin and i know that christians actually do struggle with sin so we are not saying that christians don't struggle with sin but paul in his uh letter to uh, timothy when given the qualifications of a pastor Mm. and a deacon, says that he is not to be addicted to much wine. 
okay? That a pastor is not to be an, an, an addict. He's not to be addicted to wine. He's not to, 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 to uh, indulge in that kind of lifestyle. And A.A. A. Allen did. Also, A.A. A. Allen brought disrepute on the body of Christ mm-hmm. by being in the news about all of this stuff. He was not qualified to do what he was doing. So A.A. A. Allen was a false teacher, folks. Mark and avoid him and his teachings. Thanks for watching. Bye.